All right, good. Thank you much. Thanks, thanks so much for coming. I'm Senator Karen Housley from Stillwater, the co-chair of the Frontline Workers Working Pay Group. Um, we, the GOP members of the Frontline Workers Pay Group, wanted to uh, show you, let our proposal out for you guys today. If you remember, uh, the committee was tasked with distributing 250 million of the federal ARP funds, uh, and we passed that in the legislature bipartisanly. But it also came with language, and this group right here really wanted to stick to that language that we had, that we were tasked with, uh, that was passed by the legislature, and that was um, this money was supposed to go to long-term caregivers and those essential workers that had sustained and increased risk of COVID-19 exposure. Uh, those were the guidelines, and that's what we adhered to. Uh, our committee met eight times, and we heard some very heart-wrenching stories. Uh, and this was, this was very difficult for all of us to prioritize. We heard from child care providers, janitors, MnDOT employees, grocery store clerks, and the list went on and on. So many Minnesotans stepped up during the pandemic, went to work, and faced the fear of possible COVID exposure. But a few groups really, really stood out to us. Uh, not only did they face the fear of possible COVID exposure, but they knew every single day when they walked into work, they would most definitely face a COVID exposure. And not just face it, they would have sustained and intimate exposure to COVID-19 every single day. Uh, we listened to personal stories from, from this group of workers, uh, the long-term care workers, the nursing home employees, first responders, nurses, prison guards, and healthcare employees. Uh, uh, some, of the, some of the testimony, if you haven't heard it already, I just want to I want to reiterate who some of these people who came before our committee. Uh, Brittany Westerman, she was a med surge nurse at Alamere. Uh, she said, and I quote, we nurses are exhausted. We are called five to ten times a day asking us to come in and work more. I hear from many of my fellow nurses that they've lost their passion for health care and have lost their ability to empathize, and they worry that they're bringing home this constant, constant stress and pressure to their families. She went on to say, the nursing prof profession has been one of the most trusted professions for years, and this money can show us that you truly care for us the way that we have cared for you. Uh, in terms of risk, we didn't wonder if we were encountering COVID. We knew it. We were interacting with COVID patients intimately every single day. Arlen Swanson, he's a director at Maple Care uh, Senior Care, uh, Maple Lawn Senior Care in Fulda, Minnesota. He told us about one of his employees, Melissa, a nursing assistant. Uh, every day when she goes to work, she has to wear a mask and goggles for eight to 10 hours a day. She cares for 10 elderly residents, some who have COVID, and she's taking care of their most personal needs, like taking them to the bathroom, showering and dressing them, assisting them with meals, and giving them all individual, individualized care, all while wearing a complete gown, PPE, and a respirator mask. Plus, she's doing this on a double shift for 10 days straight in a row because she's picking up extra shifts because they have no employees that are available to work. She's trying to keep up on the ever-changing uh, rules from MDH, OSHA, CDC guidelines so she can let the families know, the residents, what are the safety precautions. And in the meantime, she's holding the hand of a resident who is at the end of their life and no family can come visit. Arlen said they're trying to do social distancing in the facilities to a world where seniors are just craving touch and comfort. The morale in the long-term care facilities is at an all-time low, and yet these folks have saved lives by standing in the gap. He said that his long-term care staff are heroes and they're worn out. This money would mean so much to them, so well-deserved. Uh, Nathan Johnson, a director at Pioneer Senior Care in Fergus Falls, he said that his staff has endured more than they ever could have imagined since March of 2020. They pivot with the evolving and ever-changing standards for infection control, PPE supply shortages, visiting restrictions, testing requirements. Then they com combat all of this with the effects of social isolation. There's just no end in sight. It's really taken a toll on their, wor their workforce, and they're at a tipping point now in our long-term care facilities. They have so many open shifts, but no employees to fill them. 
They're at the tipping point where they're going to have to close some buildings, they're going to have to close facilities, and they're going to have to completely shut down some of our long-term care and nursing homes. Uh, Sarah Holmgood, a nurse manager with Wheelia Health, uh, she's, a, she's been a nurse for 30 years. She testified before the committee. She said she has seen so many casualties from the 35W collapse, 35W bridge collapse, Ebola, H1N1, uh, emergency room situations. She's never in her life seen fear in the eyes of her peers until COVID-19. And she's never had her peers feel as much stress since COVID-19 either in the last 19 months. She said, we showed up because it was the right thing to do. We continue to rise to the challenge every single day. I don't want to discredit any other frontline workers, she said, who helped to keep the economy going, but did any of them help a man dying from COVID? We heard so many more stories, uh, and, and these, these women will have some more too, but it was completely heartbreaking. Um, so we really narrowed in and focused on this group that we felt had uh, sustained and uh, COVID exposure uh, and an increased risk. Um, so if you remember, the governor deemed 1.3 million workers in the state of Minnesota as essential. And at one point in the committee, one of the committee members said, not any of us, um, that they felt that we should be giving each one of those $1.3 million, $1 million uh, workers uh, each $1,500. Well, that came with a $2 billion price tag. We are tasked with $250 million, and that's it. That's all that the legislature has passed, $250 million. That was our task. So we finally got some numbers from Deed. Uh, and now, of who would be in that group, uh, long-term caregivers, uh, nursing home employees, um, PCAs, first responders, um, corrections officers, what is, what is a meaningful amount? So then the, the three of us had to, and again, we heard a $1,500 number tossed out there earlier. So what is a, what is a meaningful amount for working an eight to 10 hour uh, double shift 10 days in a row? or holding grandma's hand as she passes alone without family at her side, or double masking, wearing goggles, full PPE if it's even available, all day, every single day, and then to come home and have to strip down, uh, throw your clothes in the washer, wash them, and shower yourself, and do this over and over every single day, or quarantine yourself uh, from your family two weeks by sleeping in a camper in the driveway. There's no end in sight for these workers. Uh, and, and it continues. Now we're in the fourth wave of COVID and it, it continues both in our, for our healthcare workers and our long-term care facilities. Um, these folks are exhausted. Uh, the morale is at the lowest it's ever been. Uh, many have left the profession and many are contemplating it. And staff levels are at their all time low. Uh, we have decided um, a meaningful amount for, for this group of workers. Again, um, the sectors of, of nursing homes, long-term care, nurses, healthcare aides, first responders, corrections officers, and hospice workers uh, that didn't have the option to work remotely. That Again, there was a few things that we agreed upon in committee, and one of them was they did not have the option to work remotely. Uh, so, but we really honed in on this sector, and we feel that a meaningful amount for these folks would be $1,200. Uh, this bonus shows our gratitude to these critical care workers who put themselves most at risk to keep the rest of us safe and healthy. This $1,200 would be a big thank you, a thank you for truly being heroes during the pandemic. Uh, some of the details of the frontline worker bonus pay you can see on your sheet. Um, Again, we agreed upon they couldn't work from home. We also agreed in committee um, that we, there would be an application process that they would either go through the Department of Deed or Department of Revenue. And we also agreed that this bonus pay would not be taxed by the state of Minnesota. Um, we've added that they would have to have received at least or less than one month of unemployment and they need to have worked a minimum of between March 2020 and December 2020, a minimum of 30 hours a week. Uh, average. Average, that's right, average <laughs> of 30 hours a week. Uh, it truly is time to get these hero pay bonus checks out to these frontline workers as soon as possible, and we're ready to do it. Our goal is to get this money to them for the holidays because these heroes truly, truly have earned it.
Thank you, and I will pass it on to Representative New. Thank you, thank you, Senator Housley. And um, Senator Housley mentioned that that we agree on a lot. And it really is a lot. We agree that we want to see meaningful bonuses for these folks. Again, um, some of our Democrat colleagues suggested maybe $1,500. It just doesn't work with the math that we have. And so we have found that if we focus on those frontline healthcare workers, who we believe certainly were assuming the greatest risk through the pandemic, um, we can probably do a $1,200 bonus for those folks and, and cover that with this $250 million that we've been tasked with. And we think this is really critical. These frontline workers, boy, we heard story after story in, in uh, committee. And one of those stories was from a nurse who had contracted COVID. She had been working with COVID patients. She contracted COVID. And uh, while she was in isolation, appropriately, she lost her husband. Her husband um, became suddenly ill and, and passed away very suddenly. And she was not able to be with him during that time because of her job, because what she was doing to keep Minnesotans safe. Um, I, uh, I was with some PCAs a couple of weeks ago, and in the conversation with, with some friends, they talked about their colleagues who literally moved in with their clients to keep them safe because if they were coming and going and going back to their own families, they knew that they would have been increasing the risk of, of their clients, their very vulnerable clients, contracting COVID. They sacrificed so much that they were willing to, to move in with their clients to keep them safe. Uh, I have another friend who had a massive heart attack, actually, during the pandemic. And, and he talks about the six first responders who were in his kitchen performing CPR. They had no idea what his status was. They didn't know if he had COVID. It didn't matter. They were there. They were doing their jobs. Uh, and, and finally, I have, I have a, a dear friend who is currently visiting her sister who is in the hospital right now. She's been in the ICU for 44 days. She's actually a traveling COVID nurse. So she's been traveling around the country taking care of COVID patients. Uh, she's fully vaccinated and she contracted a breakthrough case of COVID through, through her work. Um, and she has now been in the ICU for 44 days. She, she's had a, a trach placed at this point. She is still on a ventilator. And she did this caring for people with COVID around the country. Uh, we really believe We've been tasked with distributing $250 million. And if we focus on these frontline healthcare workers, we can make sure that those folks get a meaningful award for what they've done and for the service they've given to Minnesotans. And with that, I'll turn the time over to Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you very much, Senator Housley and Representative New Brindley. I'm State Senator Mary Kiffmeyer. Glad to be with you today. For myself, I am a nurse. I'm quite aware of the work of nurses. Not only that, though, five of my immediate family members are nurses. And several of them took care of COVID patients and the work that they've gone through. One thing, when you hear the testimony as reflected by Senator Housing and Representative New Brindley, you hear these stories, you quickly recognize that there are those who went above and beyond the call of duty. Um, they had sustained extremely high risk that set them as a group in a very, very special recognition that is needed for them, but not just because of what they have done, but what we need them to do. We still need them to do this. And so being able to give them this meaningful uh, money would be very helpful in helping to retain long-term care, to retain our nurses, to retain our first responders, the Department of Corrections, the hospice workers, respiratory therapists, and those. You clearly see after all of this testimony that this is a very special group of people. I do want to recognize that all Minnesotans have gone through a very challenging time, without question, without question. 
But there, when you've heard all these testimonies, you recognize that this particular group of people, with the money that we have in this $250 million, are without question the ones who have had the highest risk, the sustained risk, and are in a uh, level of risk that is higher than, and than others or And other Minnesotans would readily say, yeah, we get that, because they saw the nursing home, they saw the long-term care, they saw the ICU, they saw the first responders, they understand that Minnesotans do. And so that has been our focus, and I think that is the charge of both the federal and of the state law, and that we have um, been very focused with that. So thank you very much. Um, we'll be glad to answer any questions. Well, there are no Democrats here with you, so that means there is no agreement. Is it just over the dollar amount, or is it the categories of workers who will be included? Um, thanks, Tom. This is our proposal, and this is where we think the $250 million. Uh, we will get together again with the committee and, and see where they're at, but uh, this, is, this is what we came up with and that we think this is who is worthy of this $250 million hero bonus pay. Do they, from what you understand, do they want a wider swath of workers included, food service workers, those types of people? Um, we're just going to focus on these folks. I'm not sure what they want. I've heard other things out there in the media, but um, this is what we want to focus on is this group to yeah, make sure that they can. Them, you know what they want. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> they, they, in committee, they hinted that they wanted a, a wider, uh, both uh, Senator Murphy, Representative Frazier, and Representative Winkler, they all hinted that they wanted to have a, a broader net. But we really, there's only $250 million. We don't have $2 billion. So with the $250 million, this is what we've, just, this is the proposal that we've put forth. I can jump in on this too. Okay. You know, um, when the Democrats initially made their proposal, they suggested $1,500 per person. Uh, but when you did the math on that, and, the, and then the, the, the suggestion with that then was that it would be an application process, and that however many people applied, um, it would actually be distributed evenly among the number of applicants. The problem is, with that is that they, they were going to publicly say that they were giving people $1,500. But when you divided that out by their eligible pool of workers, we were looking at about $200. That's a bait and switch. We cannot do that to Minnesotans. We have to make decisions. And the decision here is obvious. The decision here is obvious. There is a group of workers, those who worked in long-term care, in hospitals, those nurses, those first responders. These folks were assuming risk that other people just were not assuming. And, and it is, uh, it behooves us as a legislature to acknowledge that and to award that and to thank those workers for what they've done. And uh, like I said, we don't think we can actually get to $1,500, but we think we could get to about 1,200. So we can get close to that number that the Democrats suggested um, by making sure that we're focusing on this group of folks who frankly took care of the most vulnerable throughout the pandemic. Can I ask you a question about sort of what this whole thing says about our politics, that three Republicans, three Democrats, and three appointed commissioners can't give money away? <laughs> well, I mean, should it really be hard to give money away? I actually, I actually think we're close. It, it shouldn't be. In fact, I've said that from the beginning. Like, what an amazing opportunity we have to sit on this committee and be tasked with really being able to to give this hero pay to folks. I mean, what a, an amazing opportunity we have as legislators. And I think the good news, as we've said, there is far more that we agree on here than that we don't agree on. And, um, and I think we'll get there. We certainly can get there. And it will be a shame uh, if, if the Democrats choose to hold this up. These, this group of workers clearly deserves this bonus pay. Um, and we're here to fight to make sure that happens. Since the creation of the pandemic bonus uh, working group uh, you know, happened, there's been a couple more issues that have come up, including the potential for drought relief legislation in any special session. But now Governor Tim Wall says he won't call a special session without assurances that a confirmation vote won't be held on, on someone like Health Commissioner Jan Malcolm. As members of the working group on the pandemic bonus pay, where do you stand on whether other things like a confirmation vote or other legislation should be on the agenda as well? 